Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 9. If you have your app, you can look up the sermon notes there. If you have your worship folder, you can pull out the insert there in the worship folder and you have the sermon notes. I'd love for you to follow along with me as we get into God's Word. Let's, let's allow God's Word to feed us this morning, right? Let's allow it to speak to our hearts and, and lives. And so thank you. Thank you for being here and, and, uh, and your just the worship. is what a great spirit is this morning. So thank you, Lord, for blessing us with your presence this morning. Uh, <clears throat> Philippians 4. Uh, today I'm talking about, I, I said earlier, I'm talking about mental health. This is a, 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 a major issue for us as a church. I committed, really, it's, I can't believe I was looking back at my notes. It's been a couple of years now since I did the series on, uh, on mental health, and I really wanted to make a commitment to continue to talk about this. But as you can imagine, it's a challenging topic to, to talk through and talk about, and so that's why it made it into this taboo series, because it's just at times challenging to talk about. And so here we go. Philippians 4, 5 through 9 is our text for this morning. <clears throat> it says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice in the New International Version, NIV. Uh, if you have that version of Bible, it says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice, right? Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. <clears throat> Remember, the Lord is coming. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank Him and thank Him for all that He's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting them into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. And this is the word of the Lord for us today. And we say, thanks be to God. <clears throat> You know, I'm continuing to learn in, uh, in my journey in life. I'm continuing to learn. If you are human, if you are human, you deal with mental health, right? It's just, it's just a fact. If you're human, meaning you have blood running through your veins, your heart beats, you have joints and bones and a nervous system, as well as a brain, that's questionable in me every once in a while. But anyway, it's true. You, you have emotions and feelings. That includes all of us, every single one of us. So the issue is how we deal with mental health, right? How, how, that, how we manage that. Now, I want to kind of compare and contrast. I Just w one kind of, uh, there's so many different illustrations or thoughts I could have that compares to this, but I'm going to use our hearts, right? So everyone has a heart and it beats and it helps to, the, to, to get the blood to the furthest extremities of our body and keep it flowing and the beats kind of help us to pump that blood all throughout our body. It's an amazing creation of God, right? It's the engine, if you will, of our lives <clears throat> and our bodies. But some people <clears throat> have conditions and issues that makes their hearts unhealthy. They don't work correctly. Conditions that, that you didn't ask for it, that you didn't cause, that someone else did. It just is some defect, some aspect of someone's heart. It may not be you, but you know of somebody that has some sort of defect or issue that they deal with with their heart. And just comparing that to mental health, certainly there are clinical mental health issues that can be identified as as issues that, that we, again, didn't ask for, we didn't, uh, anything we've done or someone didn't do to us, that for some reason our brains are not uh, uh, um, helping to send the right signals to, to add this much 
in our body of, of this element or this point or, or just doesn't fire correctly, whatever the case is, and the result is we have people who deal with schizophrenia or bipolar or, or clinical depression or other types of issues and things you didn't ask for, things you didn't cause or someone else didn't cause for you or to you. And so this comparison, if we think about our hearts and, and we can see some of those things, the issue with mental health is the fact that it's, sometimes it's just hard to get your head around and your hand around, your hands around, or, or see the issues of mental health and see those issues. Where issues like your heart, they can take x-rays, they can look and see and get in there and say, this is the reason. We can see this and it's much more, seemingly much more clear. And yet, continuing to compare and contrast, Sometimes people do things in their lives to make their hearts unhealthy, right? Sometimes they, they, they do things. They, they perhaps have a horrific diet. Perhaps they smoke. They have, they've gained too much weight. Or whatever the case may be, one of the top, if not the top killer in the USA is heart disease. And that, a lot of times, is caused by preventable things. And so as a result, they have heart issues. Now, similarly, in comparison, when it comes to mental health, we have some similar types of things. We have some issues that we maybe do in our life or habits that we have that really affect our mental health, that affect our day-to-day -day living, maybe disciplines and habits that we do that end up weighing on us in ways that it affects our own mental health, our emotions, our anxiety, our worries, all the things that we deal with that, that end up affecting us and, and ends up affecting us physically, emotionally, and, and in a lot of different ways that if you look back on it, much of it is potentially preventable comparison to what I dealt or talked about with the heart. Some of those things, kind of preventable type of things if we really looked at that. <clears throat> There's a, a pastor that I was introduced to by the name of Pastor Sean Hader, and, uh, and he, he says this in, in, in a couple things he wrote, and I, I just liked it, and I thought it was good quotes that he had. He says, poor mental health is caused primarily by ongoing anger, anxiety, fear, worry, feeling helpless, hopeless, and shame, and lack of self-acceptance. All of these feelings start in the mind and end in behavior. He says, I want you to hear this very clearly because it is what research, my observations, he says, and, and I kind of put this quote up here as a part of the quote within the quote here. He says, it, it's, it is at the core emotion that causes all disorder and the opposite of love, and what is that? It's fear, fear. And at the core of every mental illness, he goes on to say, and all human emotions, discomfort is, and discomfort is fear with its cousins, anxiety and worry. He says fear is behind every other negative emotion. The Bible says perfect love casts out all fear. And of course, perfect love is the only available through Christ. No mortal human has ever done it. So we can really simply or excuse me, simplify what poor mental health is, too much fear, not enough love. He says the opposite of poor mental health then is peace, contentment, and security. Last couple things he says is, therefore, optimal mental health can only be provided by God, never by the world, because these things cannot be found in the world. There is nothing in the world that can provide perfect peace, contentment, and security. Everything in the world is temporary and even risky. Now, I think there's a lot of what uh, Pastor Sean is saying here that I, I do agree with. And especially in light of the fact that when it comes to mental health in and, and, and all of our lives, I just propose to you today, and I think this is obvious, even though a lot of times we don't look at it this way because the stigmas that come along with mental health, but every one of us deal with mental health. All of us, you do, I do. Right? It's just the aspects of our mind and our brains and how, we, how our emotions are and how we deal with life on a day-to-day -day basis. And many of you would, would attest to the fact that, man, it's just been maybe one of those months and I just have felt low. Right? 
And maybe you've gone through a season where you've been in a season of depression or a season of pain or hurt. And, and whether that's one caused by loss or caused by other issues, whatever the case is, you probably relate to this some way or another. As a result, I think it's easy to state that all of us deal with mental health. And so it then becomes the question, how do we deal with it in a healthy way? Again, putting aside, and, and, and not for the sense that it doesn't matter, because it, it certainly does, and I'll talk more about this here in just a minute, but, but the, the reality is, is there are real kind of issues dealing with mental health that for some reason our brains don't fire, our thing, and listen, I live with this every day. I deal with, I understand this. And so the fact of the matter is, is I'm not trying to discount or, or, or minimize mental health issues that are ongoing and real and things that we didn't cause that we have to, to medicine and counseling and other types of things are required in order to deal with that. But I'm just, I, as I've thought about this aspect of mental health in this message, I, I just wanted to spend some time and say, what, what about for all of us? Because I think it's easy to, to, even though it's not malicious or intentional in this way, it's easy to point the finger of mental health at maybe more obvious aspects of mental health in our culture and not recognize that I deal with it every day too, and so do you. Right? Does that make sense? And so that's kind of what I wanted to spend our time with and, and help us with here this, this morning. And so this, there's mental health that, again, that's diagnos diagnosable as something is wrong with our brains and we didn't cause or control. That re again, I'm kind of restating this, but that requires medical attention, medication to help bring to balance, counseling to help manage, etc. But again, if we all agree that everyone deals with mental health, then again, what about the rest of us? We've spent the last, uh, or I've seen over especially the last 10 to 20 years, a tremendous uptick, if you will, of, in mental health diagnoses over, over that span. Right, haven't you? Different medicines. You'd be amazed at the amount of meds, the different kinds of new medications that have emerged in the medical, in the, in the uh, mental health field, in the mental health arena, over the last 10 to 20 years. It has, it has just grown, it has grown insurmountable. It is, the amount of meds are so many compared to what they had 20 years ago, which was like literally a handful or less of different things. If someone was gonna be treated for mental health, it was literally less than about four or five different types of medications and treatments, and now it's all over the map. They've got, you see a commercial, you can watch one hour of television and probably get three commercials of, of some, some sort of mental health type of help medication. So this has been something that has really been identified uh, more and more, and they're identifying this more than they did in the past, and our culture and our world continues to move. And I, I think there's some reasons for this, as, as I, I really think, in, for one, I think we're moving more and more to this post-Christian perspective in our world, and, and, and it's no wonder then that our minds and our bodies become more fearful more anxiety-filled, less content, and certainly lacking peace. I mean, once again, if you're following any, any sort of news or Twitter or, or social media or anything like that, for one, that, that maybe is affecting your, your mental health. Get off of that stuff. But, but just seeing that even this weekend and what the people are grieving in New York today, right? This loss of life. And it affects our culture and it affects our lives. And I, I want to stand here today and, and just say to you, because it's true, that the answer is Jesus, right? The answer is Jesus. Now, <clears throat> it always is Jesus. Unless you're trying to decide where you're going to go to lunch today after church, then maybe it's something other. But anyway, but I digress. But the answer for our culture and for our world and for our lives is Him. And, and seeing how we can know him better. Jesus, then, is the answer to our mental health dilemma. And please, don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to say that mental health and, and the issues that come along with that is just always spiritual issues. That's not what I'm trying to say. Right? Again, I live in this world, and I would unequivocally say to you that mental health issues 
are not really always spiritual issues, right? They're not. We want to make them spiritual issues sometimes, right? It's all about Jesus. So if you had more faith, if you, if you just kind of, if you kind of pulled up the bootstraps and, and, and went to church more, then you wouldn't deal, stop that. Stop that silliness. Because it, it, there are some real issues that we need to deal with and when it comes to mental health. But, but I do think there is some truth to some disciplines and habits that God's word teaches us that give us a healthy balance for our mental health. And I think there's some things that we could do that will teach us what it means to, to live in healthy, balanced ways. And this is where I believe our text in Philippians helps us that we're going to kind of dive into even more here in just a second. But we would all have a healthier mental health perspective if we truly lived for, embraced, and experience the God who ultimately created us, and by the way, who knows us better than even ourselves, right? It is similar to the fact that you can take a healthy beating heart, like the illustration I was using earlier, and make it unhealthy by living a certain way. You can also take a healthy God-created mental health, how you feel, how you manage emotions, how you reason, all the aspects of the mind, and live in such a way with your habits and your, and, and your patterns of living and cause your mental health to be unhealthy and end up living in fear, having anxiety, hopelessness, ultimately having a lack of peace. And so I think there's some patterns here that God created you and designed you in such a way that if we follow the direction that his word gives us, it's like hand in glove. It fits together of patterns of how to help us live in the most healthy, balanced ways. And I'm not saying that you're, this is going to be the answer that you'll never have any worries again. Not, no, but there's some disciplines and habits that we can learn that help us with a healthy mental health. And that's kind of what I wanted to really spend that time on. So again, let's look back to our text. Now here, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul is, is talking to the church at Philippi here. So the book of Philippians, the church at Philippi, he's talking to the church and just helping them with some words of encouragement, kind of wrapping up this letter to, uh, to the church at Philippi here. And, and, and ironically, gives some really good, healthy mental health uh, uh, outlook gives us a really good mental health outlook. So let's look at this again, right? A text. I want to read it one more time for us to kind of help remind us of this. And that, again, there's three major things, three kind of major things that I want to pull out of this that I think Paul really gives attention to this. And, and it could be more, but I think three main things. It says, always be full of joy in the Lord. Again, I say it again, Rejoice, right? Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for, for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about the things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Now, I, I love how he ends this because the Apostle Paul is really kind of saying similar to what I'm trying to say to you, and that is the fact that he says, listen, listen keep putting this into practice which tells me something that I think Paul is trying to get across to them and also trying to get across to you and I. And that is that these aspects, and, and that I'm going to kind of pull out these three main points as we, we go through this, is, is just the fact that these are disciplines, they're habits, they're practices that if you keep learning to put in them into practice, you will be amazed at how they will encourage your life you'll be amazed at how they lift you up and also lift up others around you, right? And so, so it, we fall into, it's so easy for us to fall into similar patterns. Kathy, he's fine, by the way. 
He's fine, by the way. Okay. Uh, it's easy for us all to fit into patterns of our lives. You will walk out of here and you will begin to do similar patterns as what you've done your whole, your whole life, right? Or, or at least be, this week. And you'll, you'll do some similar things. You'll think some similar thoughts. You'll, you'll go through, because we tend to be some creatures of habit, right? Anybody a creature of habit, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? A lot of us are, right? We do a similar things. Probably all of us, in some way, we kind of follow similar patterns, right? And our bodies kind of get into the pattern of those patterns, and we just kind of follow through with those things. And I'm not particularly talking about where you're going to eat, but even just how you, how you, about your day, and those types of things. And so beginning new habits takes time. They say it takes some, some 28, 30 days to build a new habit, right? So, so learning this, and Paul is saying to the church at Philippi, and I'm trying to say to you, that learning these new habits will take some time, and it'll take some effort, and some commitment, and sometimes it takes writing them down, and putting it somewhere where that'll remind me every day, I, this has got to be a new habit for me. Because I want to be, I want all of us to live a life of healthy mental health that ultimately it leads to health, to peace, to a healthy life of peace. And that's what Paul is saying. So habits, disciplines, right? And so we look at this text and we see three things that really stick out. Number one, he talks about rejoice in the Lord, right? Always rejoice in the Lord. Let, let everything you do, like, uh, he says it, let me say it again, rejoice, right? Be joyful. If the habit you kind of commit to, if you're like, I got to choose one of these three, just one, be joyful, right? I like to say to some people, somebody, if you are, if you are happy, you need to remind your face that that's the case, right? Because that means that you need to smile every once in a while. Have some joy, Right? And, and rejoice. And he says, don't just rejoice about just anything, right? Rejoice in the Lord, right? Rejoice that. And we sang about it this morning. God, you are so good. God is good. Every day, I can even say those words, right? I'll write it down. I'm going to rejoice. God is good. No matter my circumstances, that doesn't change the fact that God is still good. Amen, right? And so we can rejoice. This is a habit that doesn't depend on circumstances. This is a habit that doesn't depend on, on all the things that are going on around me or how my day's going. Okay, I may have to face a challenging conversation or I may have to have a, have a challenging situation that I did not cause or something just happened, right? But I can, and in the midst of that, I can still rejoice. And that's the discipline that, that Paul is, is trying to implore us, right? And he even kind of goes a little, kind of goes, gets into it a little bit, right? I can almost sense Paul being tempted. Oh, I want to talk about this more, right? Because he says, he says, what did he say? He says, see that you are considerate to others, right? Right, this rejoice, right? He just says, and I kind of hear him say, like, just be kind, right? Put the smile on your face and be kind. And I got to thinking about that this week, and I, I was thinking about, I wonder throughout this week, have I been considerate to others all week long? And, and, and I was thinking, you know, I, I, I did pretty good with that. You know, I, I sometimes get frustrated at restaurants. Sometimes my family knows that, uh, right, that sometimes, <laughs> you're laughing, Sometimes, right, that I, I have to be like, check myself, right, about, does anybody have to check themselves on anything during the, is it just me? No? Okay, good. Some, somebody else, yeah. But, uh, but I have to learn, you know what, God, it just evidence that I just still need to surrender things to the Lord, right? It says rejoice, be joyful. And listen, you can't be inconsiderate and joyful at the same time. <laughs> you just can't. And so I think he's just kind of leaning into that perspective of being kind, right? He talks about the Lord is coming soon. In other words, we don't have time, right, to mess around here. We're not having time. Listen, be joyful in the Lord. Be joyful. That's a discipline that he's teaching us because God is good. Then the next thing he talks about to us that we see in the text, right, don't worry. And you're like, oh, that's an easy one, right? Anybody who, any worriers in the room, any worriers that you honestly, any worriers, I know some of you are worriers and you're not raising your hand. I, I need to start calling out some names. Here we go. <laughs> right, you're worrying about worrying, right, yeah. 
But right, so, so instead, he says, instead, pray. Now again, this is a discipline for us, right? He's giving us some help on, on what to do. Because it's one thing for me to stand here before you, or even Paul, if he were here, to be like, hey, everybody, don't worry. And you're like, oh, thanks. Right? But, he, but he's saying to us, no, no, instead, pray. Right? Make it a habit, a discipline for our lives spiritually that when that worry bug kind of pops in your head, you're like, it's all the time. Well, guess what? He says pray all the time. Pray about everything. Pray about how you're feeling. What are you worrying about? Lord, I got to give this to you. Lord, would you just help? I'm going to just, I'm going to learn the habit of praying every time that worry perspective, that worry bug kind of jumps into my head. And let me say a couple things about this here. I don't think Paul is instructing us to push emotions away. Uh, That's not what Paul is driving at here. Right? I think Jesus modeled plenty of emotions as we look in the Gospels. Right? He laughed. He cried. Right? Jesus wept when he looked over Jerusalem. Right? He wept when, when, when his friend Lazarus was, was, uh, was dead. Right? He got impatient with disciples and the Pharisees. He turned over tables, for goodness sake. Right? Just to name a few. I can go on and on about that. Jesus modeled showing emotions throughout his whole three years of ministry that we have documented here. Right? And so it's not an issue that somehow our emotions are bad or wrong. In fact, they're God-given. Right? So showing and expressing our emotions, which tend to lead to, for some especially, lead to this aspect of worry and fear. And so as a result of that, I think Paul is instructing us, and I think he gets those instructions even from Jesus, but he, that teaches us that, listen, there's a pattern, a discipline that you can do that will help you in your worrying, and that is the discipline of prayer. Seek God. Give it to God. You're like, I'd be praying all the time. Right? That's the idea. The second thing I want to point out with this is that Paul gives us this answer and to of praying instead of worrying, which I've already talked about. But let me give you this kind of study. This is, this is funny and interesting. It says, studies show that 92% of what people worry about are either, listen to this, are either imaginary, never happened, or they're things that are completely out of our control. 92% of what we worry about. That's a high percentage. Most of what you worry about is either stuff that you're making up in your head that could happen or, or maybe never will or somehow is, is worrying about something that is totally even un- impossible to happen or things that are totally out of our control or maybe have never even happened before, which makes 92% of our worry a complete waste of time. <laughs> but here's the thing. Satan right? The enemy of our soul, right? Loves to corrupt our minds. He lies to you and I, which kind of instills these seeds of doubt and worry. And so that, that's what the enemy wants to do. His whole, his whole agenda is to lie, steal, and kill, right? He wants to destroy your life. He wants to destroy your, your spiritual life especially. And if he can just leave you kind of kind of quasi-committed to Jesus where you just kind of go through the motions, he's going to, for the most part, just leave you alone as a believer. Because you're no threat to him or anybody else spiritually. But I think this aspect of what Paul is talking about in praying and not worrying teaches us that, you know, there are things that are just out of my control. There are things that my mind does such an amazing job of making up and thinking about what could happen, what might happen, what didn't. And it's just, there are things that I just kind of develop this story, right? I do it, you do it. And as a result, I'm worrying about something that is hypothetical. Well, it could, Pastor, it could. Which kind of leads to this third point that Paul is making. Um, that I think is, is really important. And, and let me say this before I get to that third point. When we tell God how we're feeling, tell him what we need. Paul says he, God gives us peace. And not just any, any kind of peace, but a peace that is even hard to understand, 
hard to comprehend. A peace that passes all understanding. Like, I don't even understand how I'm at peace in this moment, but I am. Right? I'm okay. I might be dealing with this horrific type of situation, and I still might, boy, it's intense, and I'm still, I'm tired, I'm wiped out. But, you know, in my heart, in my soul, I'm just at peace. And the only thing I can say to attribute to that is God is good. Rejoice in the Lord always, right? And I just choose not to worry because there's things out of my control. And even though maybe I made a mistake or someone did something to me, listen, I can still have peace. And that's what Paul is telling us when we, when we give to God our lives, when we surrender at his feet our worries, and we just literally, almost like I can uh, put in my head this imagination that, that, that since I imagine about everything else and worry about it, I might as well imagine about this, that I can literally take my worries and just lay it at the foot of the cross and say, God, it's yours. Would you, would you deal with this for me? Help me. Give me peace. And in fact, he goes on and says, in fact, you, it will give you a peace that will guard your hearts and minds. Right? So this habit, this discipline of surrendering our our worries to him. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything, Paul says, right? But this habit and discipline of, of doing that will begin to guard your hearts and your minds so when these worry bugs start to pop up, when these issues begin to come, this is almost like you begin to build as a part of this discipline, this protection of your mind. And then all of a sudden, things that used to worry you, things that used to, to, to really kind of kind of get you all tied up in knots, just aren't doing that anymore. Why? Because His Holy Spirit begins to guard our hearts and minds as a result of, of this discipline of surrendering to God, to not worry, to give to God, God, I'm going to trust you for that and rejoice in you. And that, my friends, is called peace. Right? That's peace that he gives us. Again, which leads to this, this last point that Paul makes. Right, Fix your eyes. I, I said, I'm saying eyes here, and as I was rereading that, I, I realized really he's talking about fix your thoughts, but I, I'm kind of in the same vein as that, so I want to make sure and clarify that I'm not trying to change the words of the Scripture here. Right, That we, we fix our attention, our eyes, our thoughts, where we look, how we live. Fix your attention on what is true, right? Fix our attention on those things that are, that are true, that are pure, that are lovely, that are commendable, right? Those things that are, are worthwhile, anything of excellence, right? Be thinking about those things. Focus our minds on everything that brings praise to God and to people. I believe in, the ess in essence he is saying, yes, there's a lot of garbage to think about in the world, but we can choose to focus on either the negative or the positive. And again, boy, this is a lot easier to say than do. Because it's so easy for me and you to just look at the negative side of things. In fact, when things are tough, when things are bad, or something doesn't go the way we expect, it's just easy to, to say something negative and to be, well, you know, that person is just... Try the discipline of fixing our eyes and our thoughts on those things that are true and admirable and pure and those things that are, that, are, that are encouraging to others. Focus our mind on those things. Again, this is not a denial of negative, right? It's just that we will choose to kind of settle our mind or have our mind settle on those positive things. Now, unfortunately, I think there's a lot of people, Christian or not, churchgoers or not, who again always like talking about the problems and the faults of our world and the faults of the church and the faults of fellow Christians and others. If, if the church, one of the things that I, I don't look at Twitter all that much, I do off and on throughout the week, but one of the things that, I, that always frustrates me is how much Christians cannibalize Christians, right? How, many, how much Christians really tear down Christians? And it's just, it's like, stop. The, the idea that if you live this way, if you're a true Christian, you're going to do this. If you're a true Christian, you know, and, and this idea of that. And again, I don't think he's trying to push us away from negative things, Paul. I think he's trying to help us. Listen, think about those things that are true. 
and right. Well, that is true, and that's true that that person's a jerk, right? But it, it's possible that you could keep your mouth shut and talk about things that are positive instead of negative. And you're like, well, if I do that, I won't have a whole lot to say. Try, try that for a while, right? See how that fits. The point I'm saying here is there's some disciplines that you can have. And even in this, this third piece that Paul is talking about, when it comes to our mental health, I love how the, God, the, the Word of God really helps us in these ways to, to, to develop, and the Apostle Paul is helping us develop these disciplines that will help you be healthy. Right? And, and our tendency is to fall into patterns of habits that we already have, and as a result of those habits, similar to a, a healthy heart, that if we do unhealthy things, it will damage my heart. Are we all in agreement? Yeah? Equally, if, if your mental health, if we continue bad habits, it will damage your mental health. And as a result, you'll have higher levels of anxiety. You'll have higher levels of fear. You'll have higher levels of, of all the different things that just cause us to be like, I just am, and I'm going to kind of go into depression. I'm going to deal with all these different things. And I'm not talking about the fact that there are actual clinical aspects of mental health that need to be dealt with. And I celebrate those things that, and honor those in, in the right ways. But I'm talking about everyone. And what would change in your life and in my life if we developed habits to rejoice in the Lord always? Right? And not worry. Let's pray. And to, to fix our thoughts, fix our eyes on the things of God and not negative and, and always going down that road. What would happen in your life and in our world for that matter if those disciplines were a part of our daily life? Lives. I would say that we would have healthier mental health. I really do. I really do. If it's true what Pastor Sean was saying, that the core of that is fear, certainly it would, it would minimize fear. Because if God is the only one we fear, if we fear God alone, what else do we have to fear about? If we build into our lives these biblical godly disciplines, I wonder what there is to fear about. If we live these disciplines, I guess it would be experiencing more peace. Right? It's like more peace and more contentment, more security versus having more fear, more worry, more anxiety. Which, if, if you're honest, maybe there's many of us in here who just live in this world of fear, worry, and anxiety a lot of the time. You don't have to raise your hand, but is that you? Right? Is that you? That you just tend to live in that world. And... and <laughs> Pastor's being mean to me today. I, I'm not, I'm not. But because I just realized this is a part of all of our lives. And as I really started thinking about mental health, I looked back at my last sermon series I did and all the messages, and, and I just felt the Holy Spirit kind of prompting me about the fact that, holy, that, that, that mental health is everybody. And I just felt the Lord kind of nudging me this direction to talk about this. I got permission from Tiffany to say this, but, uh, you know, I, we were talking this week about uh, this sermon, and, and I was just telling her a couple things about this and, at home, and, and uh, Tiffany just completed her master's uh, last week. Has it been a week now? We, oh, anyway, at, at Point Loma, I'm really proud of her. Yay, Tiffany. But, but she's just a week away next Monday, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow, from having to take her certification exam for her athletic training. It's called the BOC. And uh, it, for athletic training certificate, certification. It's kind of like taking the bar exam for a lawyer, right? You can't, you can't practice law until you, cr you know, kind of pass your bar exam. This BOC exam is similar for athletic trainers, right? You can't really, even though you've done the schooling, you can't practice athletic training until you 
complete and you pass this test. So as you can imagine, it's brought a lot of anxiety and angst into her life. And as a result, all of ours, right? So uh, worry, fearful, and so, and we got to talking about all this. And I just said, you know, I, I said, just for the record, I'm, I was planning on preaching on this for a few weeks now. So, you know, uh, I, this was not about a message about you to you and so forth. But I said, you know, we got to talking about it. And, and she said, yeah, you can, you can share a little bit about this, right? She, the fact of the matter is she fears she's going to fail, right? There's fear, right? That kind of comes back to the core. Think about an issue that you're dealing with that has been causing you worry or anxiety or fear, right? The core of that. What do you fear? She's worried about getting all the, all the information if she can get it all correct. And then, and then as a result, it causes this crazy anxiety that she's been feeling over this, especially over this last week, if not this last month. Right? And since this biblical perspective is a discipline to be learned, you know, no better place to learn it than when you're right in the middle of facing it, right? So we kind of talk through that a little bit. And let me just say here quickly, kind of pause here and say this. Please, if you've learned these disciplines more than others, and you're sitting here today and you're like, you know, th- that makes total sense. I don't deal with that like maybe some others might. That's great, uh, but that doesn't give you or I a, a reason or a right to beat someone else, beat someone else up with our words as a result, saying things like, like, you know, you just, uh, you don't need medicine, you just need to turn to Jesus, and you just got, that's the problem, it's just, you know, I, I think that sometimes we can be insensitive to people dealing with worry and anxiety and, and, and fear and those types of aspects, and I just want to encourage you, you say, well, what's the best way to deal with that? Walk alongside them, pray with them. And when you've earned the right as in friendship and relationship, then you can say some things of encouragement and, and, and say, you know, there's, there's some disciplines, there's some habits that maybe you could have. I was just hearing my pastor talk about that last week. Right? There's some disciplines that can help you in those worry, you know, and turn it. Let me pray with you. Let me help you with that. Let me help you fix our eyes on things that are right. And so some of those things I've been, I kind of, some of those points and things just came right out of Philippians were some things that I was kind of even talking to Tiffany about, right? And, and so as, it's been cool to see what God's been doing in the midst of that for her. And maybe you like, you're like, I really relate to Tiffany. I relate to what she's going through. Because maybe there's something in your life that's causing fear, worry, anxiety, causing your mental health to be out of balance, and, and you do that for too long, and you keep those habits and those patterns too long and too frequently, and believe it or not, if you don't already under, know this, is that you will then develop physical and emotional issues that will require medical attention if you continue those same habits. But the good news is God's Word gives us some solutions. It gives us kind of a, a, an alternative, another way to handle this. And in fact, like I said earlier, God created you and me. He knows you intimately. He knows how you tick. And so it makes sense for us to follow what God's word says because it will be perfect to help your life, your mental health, and the patterns of your life. So follow the disciplines that his word teaches us because he created them for you and for me. And certainly the text in Philippians 4 gives us some of those really good understanding of those disciplines. But I want to close with this, this last verse. I love this. It's out of Matthew chapter 11. You see it on the screen there. Then Jesus said, I just want to tell you kind of the comparative to our world, whatever other world religion tells us and, and says to what Jesus says. And I, I just love this. What a great way to kind of wrap this up here this morning. Then Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. What what he's saying is, listen, my word, the yoke, if you will, right, The, 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 the farming tool that is put around an oxen or 
or cow that, that helps them plow a field, right? This, this yoke, this burden that you have to carry to help kind of plowing away, if you will, right? This yoke, this burden, he's saying, is God's word and the instruction that he gives us, right? So he's saying that. Take my yoke upon you. Take my instructions upon you. Let me teach you, right? Here's that language of disciplines and habits, right? Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls, For my yoke, he's saying, is easy to bear. And the burden I give you is light. He's not talking about something that just burdens us. He's not really ready to burden you with these instructions. These habits will free you. Right? Do you see that? If they are light, they'll give you air in your feet, and it'll be something that you'll you'll find joy. You'll find peace versus the burden of fear and and anxiety and worry that causes us to want to cower and and not be confident and to to crawl away and go hide in a hole. I'm going back to bed, thank you very much. Right? Which might be good every once in a while to go take a long nap. But you live like that day in and day out and it becomes very unhealthy, right? Jesus says, now here's the thing. The world tends to say, maybe doctors and and counselors, and pastors, and others, do this, do that, do this, do that, right? And in a lot of ways, or in some ways, those are good things to follow. Follow what your doctor says, right? But I just want to point this out to us that I think is so beautiful, and with this, I'm closing. The world says, do. But do you notice? Jesus says, come. Let's stand again. You and I's mental health is really important. And I know this is a tough topic to deal with because I think a lot of folks, just, this is such an issue that we wrestle with so much. And our world, all that goes on, brings even more fear, more anxiety. And, but I think these disciplines should teach us what it means to follow him, right? Rejoice. Don't worry. Pray. Just give it to God. Continually get the habit of giving it to God. Right? And then always fix your eyes. Fix your thoughts on things that are above, onto Him. Fix your eyes on Jesus. What's right. What is true. And God will give you peace. Because He invites us. He doesn't say, go do this, go do that. He says, come. Are you weary? Are you heavy laden? You come. You will find rest for your soul. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. As we wrap up this service, maybe there's somebody here today. Maybe there's a lot of people here today that these words of encouragement from your word is exactly what we needed to hear. To help us. We've been carrying a burden of fear and anxiety and worry for so long about so many things that perhaps today we just feel a little bit lighter. And that will only happen when we say these things. Lord, I just give myself to you. I give these issues to you. I ask for your comfort and for your help. So Lord, for somebody here today, maybe even if it's just one person, Lord, for somebody here today, Would you just, even right now, just pray this prayer to God? Say, Lord, I give you my worry. I give you my fear. I give you my anxiety. And I ask that you fill it with your presence. Fill that void with confidence and peace. We need you, Jesus more than ever in our world, but more than ever in our lives. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be people of peace. And as a result, we indeed will rejoice. Oh, God, help us to build new habits 
renewed habits in our lives. Let them, but let us stamp them on our foreheads. Let us put them on cards and put them on our mirror. Write it in, in places that will remember that you are first in our lives. And the things that come into our world are but temporary. So help us, Lord, and may we live healthy mental health every day. In your name I pray. Amen. I'm going to stay up front. If I could pray for you in any way, you feel free to come up. I'd love to pray with you. Tell about 20 people that you love them, right? Okay, maybe five. Go. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you next week.